Hello. Um, today I'm going to talk about how to tackle immune system infections with COVID-19. Apart from the slide on my potential conflict of interest, I would like to start with this sentence by Miguel de Unamuno, so reminding us that true science teaches uh, above all to doubt and be ignorant. And I think in this, this is actually learning um, uh, with different changes and different studies and, and also our, our opinions changed over time. I think also this slide is, uh, it's been uh, widely used because uh, it nicely depicts the viral phase, the first part of the disease and the host immune response. We actually don't know now where the borders are. So for example, we don't know for how long the viral phase is relevant in terms of eliciting and worsening immune response. And how early we do have in host immune response. I think it changes a lot according to different patients. Some have very early acute immune response and some others kind of later. And it will be very important for us to, to, to also um, assess when, uh, whether our treatment are effective or not to have somehow thresholds. So are we able to identify patients in the first phase, second phase, third or fourth phase, according to, let's say, biomarkers, for example, and at this stage, we are not. Um, I think it's also important to remember the, the pathogenesis, this, the, the, the thought pathogenesis about COVID-19. Um, uh, the cytokine release syndrome that is taken from CAR T cell treatment is actually the one that is thought to be important in terms of uh, um, release of several biomarkers and cytokines and the effect on several organs and tissues, not only the lungs, but it's, it's kind of a systemic uh, disorder. Uh, but the machine learning program also identified bradykinin um, storm as being important and be linked to AC2 and also to some of the effects we, we see uh, both in lung and extra uh, pulmonary manifestations. So it's also important to understand which is the model we, we, which we should refer to because treatment might change according to that. Um, and so far, several potential therapies have been developed. I will not talk about the first part that they've been touched. I will mostly um, concentrate on immune modulators. You see here, there are several pathways that might be involved in COVID-19 pathogenesis. And so I, those in red in, in the right part of the slide are those I will try to briefly um, um, go through. And I just want to leave this slide that we are not just describing it, but it's what we're doing now in Turin. And I have to say that this slide has been updated so many times in the last two years, let's say, a uh, half, one year and a half. Um, because with new data and, 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 and new opportunities, actually, it changed, it changed a lot. Um, I think I will start with corticosteroids. This is because they are now somehow the standard of care for patients with uh, moderate to severe COVID-19 disease. Um, the slide here is taken from a British medical journal, Life Meta-Analysis. I think it's a very important resource. And as you can see, you have different treatments here in the first column and different endpoints in the first row. And if you take a look at corticosteroids, they are the only one with several um, dark green, that means a high certainty in terms of data. And they are the only one with a dark green in terms of mortality. And so I think this is important also to evaluate. This is a natural meta-analysis and also somehow helps us comparing treatment that not being compared before. Most of the data and the, the most important data actually started with recovery study with dexamethasone six milligrams for five to 10 days in hospitalized patients. Um, this, is, this is a very important study, the one that actually uh, suggested and confirmed the role for corticosteroids. As you can see at uh, the forest plot, actually the, the, the best effect, the most important effect, well, in patients with invasive mechanical ventilation, uh, there was an effect in those receiving oxygen, but not effect in those that were um, not receiving supplementary oxygen. And I think it's also important because it, it helped us to understand why the effect on mortality was less pronounced as compared to the effect on invasive mechan mechanical ventilation incidence. After the release of this data, several other trials actually were early stopped because of recovery data because of, of the thought of utility, since those data were so robust that it was not necessary to keep on with the study. So we will not have data on most of the other treatments in terms of other corticosteroids or other dosages. However, we now have this interesting meta-analysis published in JAMA uh, um, this year, 
and which in the end we do have data on the overall use of corticosteroids, both in terms of mortality, it's the forest spot on the left, and also on the association between um, other secondary endpoints. And all of these favor the use of corticosteroids. Still, I think there are some open questions in this setting. And one of these questions is, why 60 milligrams dexamethasone everyone? But we're treating patients weighing 558 kilos, some others weighing 120. Why not using a weight-based dosage? Or why dexamethasone and other? So there are some, I think, reasons for that. And but so far, the best data are on dexamethasone, 60 milligrams from five to 10 days. However, recent studies this year, one observational study here in the upper part, one randomized, small randomized study in the, in the lower part, suggested that methylprednisolone, a higher dosage, might be uh, useful in certain patients. But I think the, the certainty in those studies is very, very low at this point. We need to update it with new data. The only exception to this, in my mind, is CNS involvement. So CNS involvement has been, been shown in several patients with COVID-19, mostly in, in those elderly ones. Um, and if you take the model of cytokine release syndrome, we also know that some patients might develop these ICAMs, so immune effector cell-associated immunotoxicity syndrome, that is a, um, a CNS-targeted um, toxic effect in patients receiving CAR T cell. I just want to, to show you that some of the symptoms, including delirium, are the same we observe in COVID-19. And the treatment is basically dexamethasone at much higher dosages. So grade two and grade three receive 40 milligrams of dexamethasone, while grade four, patients are usually in coma, they receive one gram of methylprednisolone. So it might be in the CNS involvement, we might increase the dosage of corticosteroids, but we need definitely data on that. We move them on the other treatment has been uh, widely used and is actually anti intelligent 6 or intelligent 6 receptor medication. We do have three drugs on the market, two, tocilizumab and cerilumab that blocks the receptor, and one is siltuximab that is a direct inhibitor of interleukin-6. Um, most of the data on these are, were retrospective, and but all of them were really positive in terms of reduction in mortality, reduction of severe COVID-19, and, and no increase in secondary infections. Uh, but the first randomized studies actually were not in favor of the use of tocilizumab. So there was a loss of enthusiasm at the end of last year. But after that, two important studies, REMAPCAP and Recovery, published the data, and this is all collected together in a meta-analysis uh, published in JAMA again this year. And as you can see, uh, both in terms of mortality and also on the use of invasive mechanism ventilation, ECMO or death, you see there's an advantage of the use of anti interleukin 6 receptor inhibitors. Um, however, we do use tocilizumab, but I think there are still some open questions. One is timing, early versus late. Is it, should it just be based on clinical and, and, and then respiratory parameters or so some lab test? One or two doses. I just remind you that NIH and NHS suggest the use of one, only one dose. Uh, maybe subcutaneous versus intravenous. We have some data on that. Uh, but also the idea of combination therapy. We had before some observational data, but now we do have the randomized data of recovery. You see here in this um, and, and second endpoint analysis, you see that the, the, be, the, the higher effect, the highest effect was observed in patients receiving tocilizumab and corticosteroids. So suggesting that potentially there's an effect of the two drugs given together in patients with severe COVID-19. So this is what we use. We, we try to combine NIH and NHS um, criteria. So we use them in the first hours after the delivery of ICU-like level of oxygenation or in patients that despite the use of corticosteroids have an increasing need of oxygen and have a CRP above 7.5. So what, this is what we're doing now, uh, in the, actually in the last six months in theory. I would like to briefly touch other, other pathways, including anti interleukin 1 receptor medication. We do have data both on anakinra and canakinumab. Preliminary data by an Italian group, very small study, suggests an effect. But after that, we do have several studies that suggest there is a mix of results, actually. I want to point out that inclusion criteria and the dose of administration are really different. For example, this study in orange, that I one that found some effect use it 400 milligrams of anakira intravenously. Some other use it only 200 milligrams subcutaneously. So there's a significant difference and, and it might also come, uh, actually affect the results we observe. 
Uh, and this is the last study, randomized study done on the Kira, published in Lancet, uh, written this year. Actually, they found no major effect of the use of the Kira. The same is for canakinumab. Again, no striking effect in the use in a randomized controlled trial. Some effect in, in, in patients, uh, in, in moderate patients, some effect on biomarkers, but no effect on mortality or the use of invasive ventilation. So at this time point of interleukin-1 receptor inhibitors are not suggested for, for use in patients with severe COVID-19. Another important pathway is an intracellular pathway is actually those of Janus kinase 1 and 2, so JAK1, JAK2 inhibitors. We also have a couple of drugs in the market, baricitinib and ruxolitinib, and have been tested in several studies. Uh, baricitinib has been theorized since, since I think it was April, suggesting two effects. One is on inflammation, the second one is on down regulation of AC2. Um, and so first studies suggested a potential effect but in this study, it's an important randomized study, and in the English Journal of Medicine, there was no corticosteroids. So we didn't know what the effect was dependent or independent of a potential important standard of care. Um, but now we have, a, it's just a preprint. I don't like to, to discuss some preprints. I just want to give you an idea. We have a large study using baricitinib in a double blind placebo control phase three trial, suggesting an effect. And I want to point out that the effect was independent of corticosteroids administration. So you have the effect in patients receiving and those not receiving corticosteroids. So I want to see the final paper and just take a look at the final data, but I think it's something important to consider. Several other treatments have been, have been tested, such as complement inhibitors, uh, anti interferon gamma inhibitors, rexolitinib, the second JAK, JAK1, JAK2 inhibitor, intravenous immune globulins, thalidomide and convalescent plasma, but I think just being very quick that we don't have sufficient data to support the use of this drug so at this time point. I think that to some data supporting the use of colchicin. Colchicin might again have a different effects. Some are on a cellular cycle, some others are inflammatory. We already have a um, um, meta-analysis suggesting an effect both on mortality and hospitalization. I want to, to take a look here at the difference because we have some studies in hospitalized patients, some other in outpatients, and the results are different. So these are the studies on hospitalized patients. You see the two uh, red arrows suggesting no effect, including the recovery, 5,000 versus 5,000 patients, Sila preprint, no effect, and one study is some, some suggesting a beneficial effect, so mixed results. But a person like this study is called Col Corona. It's randomized outpatient study enrolling almost 4,000 patients, suggesting a, a a small effect, but a significant effect in patients that treat them very early with colchicin, outpatients. As you can see, there's a reduction in the primary composite point, but the best effect, let's say, in terms of odds ratio reduction was, was mechanical ventilation. So I think it's an important thing. The drug is, was well tolerated, but from diarrhea, so it should be considered in our algorithms. And again, there's a lot of discussion on vitamin D. It's a, a, the last drug I'm considering. And I think it's important because it's perceived to be safe. Uh, we do have data on different levels of vitamin D in patients with different severity of COVID-19. And so bradykin in store might involve vitamin D. So it might make sense. However, so far, we, till now, we only have one very small study using cal calcifidiol that I want to remind you is the activated form of vitamin D and doesn't need to, to go through the liver. That is in the moment of our hyperinflammation might be reduced the metabolism. And it was very small study suggesting some beneficial effect, but recent study in JAMA using 200,000 units of colocalciferol, actually no major effect. There was a signal for, for the reduction of mechanical ventilation need, but no major effect. So we know it's well tolerated and safe, but we don't have enough data now to suggest a great, very, very super effect of vitamin E supplementation. And I also want to remind you that the data is a review published in May, 2021, there are not enough evidence-based data to suggest outpatient treatments. So several drugs, including acetromycin, hydroxychloroquine, have been tested, but so far we have no data that might support the use of those. And I have to struggle and discuss with several colleagues on this topic. So in conclusion, I think there's no magic bullet. We don't have now a single drug, perfect drug that may actually tackle the immune system. I think it will be a combination of timely and tailored intervention according to risk of progression, 
phase of disease and, and pulmonary involvement, and except pulmonary involvement, sorry. Uh, so far, we do have data, robust data, on dexamethasone and docilizumab. But I want to steal this slide from Peter Hunt talking about HIV. So where are we actually working on the, the, the tree of inflammation? Are we working on the branches, on the trunk, on the roots? And it's very important to understand which is actually the pathogenesis, because we might be much more precise, we might do a very, much more useful treatment in this patient. And also, there's still a lot of ongoing randomized clinical trials. We need to take a look at the data. We need to be very critical in evaluating the setting, the methods, and the result. And I want to close with a lot of open questions. So are we sure dexamethasone 6 milligrams you know, in every patient? Might we think about weight-based um, um, dosage? Or maybe what about CNS involvement? Are the available data enough to widely use colchicine in patients and baricitin in hospitalized ones? And what about high dose calcifidiol? So I think there's all still open questions that we need to assess in the following months. And I wanna thank you for your attention and I have to discuss it with father. This is my email. You can write me, um, I think we can discuss it further by email. Thank you.